Questions on anything first? <clears throat> for those taking the course for credit, uh, I'm assuming that not only are you listening to the lectures, but as I give re references to the reading, uh, if you have uh, if you want to expand on, on what I say, uh, you will be looking at, at those references. <laughs> In particular, I'm going to be making some specific reading assignments shortly. <clears throat> I will let you know, first of all, that lectures one through seven, that is to say right up through the last Tuesday's lecture, are fully edited and are on the catalog, and so you can get at, at them from at that in that way. Uh, I'm about to start <coughs> lectures on Srivastava and Kurtek's method and I give you a reference to that book and suggest that you read the chapter of, uh, of Srivastava and Klassen's chapter on plain curves. Um, I am specifically going to be assigning some chapters in the, what I call the medial book. That's by me and, well, by Kaleem Siddiqui and me with chapters written by, by us, but also other chapters written by other people. Uh, and um, I, the book is itself available uh, in the library and but uh, I, because I was one of the, I am the co-author of the book, I have the PDFs of the chapters and I've put the PDFs of chapters one through three, which are the ones you need to look at, uh, on my Google Drive site. Okay, so, uh, yeah. So that, that's there. Um, okay, so. Let's talk about where we were. We've, we're still in the section, we're finishing up the section on PDM representations and statistics. We've seen that, the, that PDMs are XYZ values that I call zero order geometry. They, they, they <coughs> you basically benefit from higher order information that involves directions and curvatures and the like. But we've been talking so far about the zeroth order geometry, just point distribution models, okay? Which is to say the representative of a particular sample from a population is a tuple of points. And in this part of the course, we've been assuming that those points across the population are in correspondence. So you know what point one in sample one in your training population corresponds to point one in the next uh, object in the population corresponds to point one in the next Recording object. in progress. Uh, and so on. Um, okay, and the deal is that we need to be able to get correspondence not just at the specified points, but at arbitrary positions along the object, right? Or within the space. And so we've, talk, we've been talking about methods to do that. And we talked about thin place planes last time, and now I'm talking about LDD MM based methods. So these are methods that take as input the uh, point distribution for some reference object might be, for example, the mean of the point distribution models. Uh, and as well as for any given target object, you have a cor the corresponding set of points, and the deal is to go from the reference set of points find a, a best mapping of the whole space, including the points, right, 
So you have a reference point set, and you have some other point set. They both have five, yeah. <coughs> Probably be better to show it like that. Okay, and the deal is to be able to go from any place here into the corresponding place there, right? For any position here, it's associated with the position there. <laughs> they have car the idea then is if you've done this diffeomorphism right, then you have good correspondences at the implied positions and not just at the input positions. Clear? Okay, so we talked about representing a diffeomorphism in, in to a mathematician has a mapping from every point in a space, in our example we're going to be using three space, to, uh, to its place in the target at when you apply the diffeomorphism. But in a com the computer, the way we represent that in order to be able to compute from it is as a 3D image Im made up of voxels relatively densely. And at every place in the voxel, we have a curved path divided into piecewise straight paths. Okay, so we have, at any given voxel, we have a curved path, but it's made up of little pieces, each of which are assumed to be straight. And I have assumed that we have m time points along this warp, and that at each one of those time points you have one of these little vectors, so you have a vector image, <laughs> and what we said we wanted was that there's a smoothness measure on those time points. We'll talk more about diffeomorphism later, <laughs> but basically that the smoothness measure turns out to be the dot product bet <coughs> between some linear operator on V <coughs> on, on, the, on the vectors. <coughs> that linear operator I, in, the, in what I've written on the slides might be something related to, uh, to uh, little Laplacian. So in the next slide, for example, uh, boy, I wish I could get rid of this to stay okay, away. You see that L is <coughs> the uh, Laplacian operator plus a constant. Okay, so um, <coughs> and so. The idea is you want small var values of some, for example, curvature kind of measure, Laplacian is that kind of a measure, on these velocities. And the basic idea that I talked about last time is that what you have is, the idea is you have the identity diffeomorphism that takes <coughs> the space and just leaves it alone. And then you have an initial velocity in the space of all diffeomorphisms, the initial velocity at the identity. And because you have a metric that you're trying to, for your space, you can find, once you have the initial velocity, you apply the metric, and you follow that geodesic up to some point, which ideally is the point that 
has the property that the diffeomorphism phi that you get, you have there, when applied to the reference PDM, gives you the target PDM. Okay? Now there's a whole lot, whole lot behind that, including some need to, to con give constraints between one time point and the next. So you might have, for example, constraints such that the uh, volumes in a particular region don't change for in each region. Okay, so you can deform if you have a little uh, sphere in a little region of the three space for each one of those spheres. This, you, it may turn into a non-sphere, <coughs> but the thing it, that little sphere turns into doesn't change size, doesn't change volume. And if you do that for every point, then you get a set of constraints that makes the solution to this particular problem uh, a constrained optimization, and it takes semi-forever, not quite forever, but you, talking about if you try to do it in algorithmic means on a, on a relatively large space, you're talking about tens of minutes or more. But there are CNNs that have been built to do it fast. Okay, so the upshot is the method is an iterative method where you start with an initial momentum, an initial velocity image, and you follow that up and then you find <coughs> you are continuously measure, measuring phi on the reference PDM and comparing it to the target PDM and you're going to get close and then you're going to start to fall away. So you're going to find the pl closest place to where you want to be. And so if the phi that you want it to be is this place, you get here and you say, oh, I uh, am not quite what I want to have and you can measure the difference that, of where you've gotten to, to where you wish you got to, and you use that uh, information in an interesting com computation to come back down to the identity uh, and, and apply what, what a new initial velocity ought to be. <laughs> okay, and then so with that new initial velocity, you then trace up its geodesics and hopefully, if you've done this right, it gets a lot closer to the, to the fee that you want. And you look at the difference and you trace it back and you figure out the, the new velocity and the whole thing is an iterative, an iterative solution. Okay, but once you have that, <coughs> finish that iteration, you just let it converge, then <coughs> you have this ability to apply this phi not just at the sample points, not just on the PDM that you've provided, but also at every, uh, and at any other point in the space, in the three space. And uh, so this is the typically requires iterative op optimization part on the slide, and the software that does this diffometrica takes it as an input the reference point set and the target point set and goes and does this calculate these calculations for you, but it's possible that instead of just having reference points, you can have reference curves. Okay, so in my hand, I might know that the fingertips have to match in and up to the fingertips another, but you also may want to say that this curve along the side of my hand, which is the crest of my hand on this side, should map onto a corresponding crest in the target image. When I say map onto, I don't mean that, that point by point. So if you have two curves, 
I'm saying this curve maps onto that curve, but I'm not saying which specific point on that curve maps into which specific point on that curve. So the, it's a weaker constraint, but with strong, stronger piece of information than just the points. Okay. Okay. So we'll talk about Defimetrica later, and we'll talk about statistics on diffeomorphisms later in the course. But here we're just using it as a means to produce correspondences. Okay? Now I told you last time that um, thin plate splines allows you to compute a warp from a point set to a point set, but that it's not guaranteed to be diffeomorphic. It's guaranteed to be smooth, but it's not guaranteed to be one-to-one, -one, right? And also, it's not guaranteed to be symmetric in the sense that if you swap the place, you start, want to start from the target distribution and map it to the reference, you wouldn't get the inverse of doing it the other way around. And there are ways to produce methods that are these diffeomorphism methods so that you do get symmetry and guarantee of being a diffeo, right? That is to say, of being one to one. And here is the description of one of those due to Sarang Josh Joshi, who is a faculty member in biomedical engineering at the University of Utah and has been for, I don't know, 15, 20 years, but before that he was on the faculty here. Um, and. Uh, this is basically just what I, what I told you in general. It's just specific to these point sets. So you want that the derivatives with respect to t of the warp are the velocities at any t and at any x. And you have the smoothness constraint and you want to uh, minimize the smoothness constraint subject to the correspondence between the two sets of points. And when you do that uh, with an appropriate L operator, <coughs> you get a method that solves this problem for the particular situation of point sets. <laughs> and Defimetrica can do that, right? That's essentially what I've described. The thing is Defimetrica can do it not just for point sets, but for point sets and, for example, curve pair, point, not point set pairs, but also for curve pairs and some other constraints as well. Okay, you can, so in 3D you can have surface to surface match as w and not just curve to curve match. Right? Okay. Any questions on this? <coughs> the last means of correspondence is to use a, a an object description that's richer than point sets or even curves or surfaces. And the one that I have found particularly effective, and we, inv and we invented it here, what is <coughs> a, a method of skeletal map, skeletally based mapping. So now the situation, fr first of all, <coughs> there's a whole paper on this <coughs> uh, that's on my Google Drive. It's a paper, re recent paper by me, which is a, a pretty strong summary of all the work over, I don't know, three decades uh, on skeletal models here at UNC under my leadership. Uh, and um, you are expected, if you're taking the course of credit, to read this, and if you 
are not taken for credit, you still should read it. It's an online paper, right? So I have a copy of it on my Google Drive, but you'll also find it in the online journal Frontiers in Computer Science. Uh, so you can read it there alternatively, same paper. The basic idea is that till now we've basically focused on boundaries and boundaries have the property But essentially they understand themselves in regard to the relationships of what happens as you go along the boundary. And in 3D we're talking about a surface here and we're talking about the relationships between one point on my hand here and another point nearby in my hand. And there's a very important relationship of, of shape that has to do with first of all the fact that these points are importantly related and they have something to do with the object width, right? And likewise, this point and this point and so on. So there's correspondence not only along the su surface of the object but also across the object. And the other is, even though this is not a particularly wonderful example. Let me make a better example. Even though the boundary is curved one way on the top and a different way in the, in the bottom, we have this notion that the object itself is being bent as an object, right? <laughs> Another way of saying it, we're interested in information about the interior of the object and not just on the boundary of the object. Okay? So, S-reps do that. They, uh, <coughs> can, so now when you have two objects, You have this idea that these objects are going to be related not only in terms of their boundaries but also in terms of their interior properties. Uh, and in 3D, if you have an object like whose skeleton is this grid here, and at every point in the skeleton you have these so-called spokes that go from the skeleton to the boundary in a way that I will describe like shortly. That you want essentially the skeleton of one to map onto the skeleton of the other. You want the spokes of one to map onto the spokes of the other. That will make the boundary of the one map onto the boundary of the other, but it's not just the boundary has to map, but the skeletons have to map and, and so on. If you think about a, an ellipsoid, okay, this is an example of an ellipsoid. An ellipsoid is a structure with, shown by this yellow boundary, if you will. It looks like an ellipse, but it's got depth to it, right? It's, a, it's got an elliptical cross section uh, across its middle, but also it's, it's an ellipse uh, in terms of the going, around the going around the boundary from, where am I? Here we go, from here ar around the boundary to here and back here on the back side. That's an ellipse also. <laughs> okay, so you get cross-sectional ellipses making up an ellipsoid. And 
The idea is that you have, in an ellipsoid, you have three orthogonal axes, right? And they're they are called the principal axes of the ellipsoid. And one of them has the longest length of the three, the longest radius. In this picture, that longest radius goes from the middle out to here. It has a second longest one, which in this picture goes from center to here. And it has a shortest one, which in this picture goes in and out of the screen. OK? <laughs> and so you have the, this principal coordinate system. And associated with each one, you have a so-called principal radius. Right? And that entity has two things that are called vertices places that are locally sharpest curvature here and here, right? And you have a crest curve that goes from one vertex along the crest to another one. And I've defined before, I remind you, this notion of vertex and crest, okay? But anyway, for my hand, if it were ellipsoid, the crest would be around, around there. Right? <laughs> and uh, and the vert one of the vertices would be up here somewhere. <laughs> OK? Um, so, OK, so the point is that this structure has a very easily definable skeleton. <laughs> it bisects. So the front side and the back side of this, of this ellipsoid. And it is an ellipse. <laughs> right? So its skeleton is that thing. It's that ellipse. And so if we can come up with a clever way of mapping our ellipsoid with its skeleton into another object, a target object, then the idea is we can carry the skeleton by that diffeomorphism, but now a diffeomorphism applied only on the interior of the object, not in the whole surrounding space, which is what Defometric wants, uh, into, the, into your target object, and thereby you, you have not only its, its skeleton and spokes, but because you can interpolate among the, among the spokes, the corresponding, you can interpolate spokes to other spokes. For example, this pair you might interpolate to that spoke. <laughs> then you can do that same thing on this object. And then you can say that these points map onto those points. And in particular, any interior point, including the boundary, has a mapped place. So the notion is to, to have a high quality representation and to use the mapping that it implies to give you the correspondences that you want. Okay? <coughs> Moreover, this mapping doesn't just give you position to position maps. It also gives you direction to direction maps. <coughs> so certainly you're mapping the direction of these spokes onto each other. <laughs> but better still, as you will see in the upcoming lecture, uh, <coughs> Associated with the skeleton, here's one in 2D. Associated with the skeleton and the spokes is something that, that's called the radial distance fun function, which is the, the radial distance, I should say. And the radial distance is simply a fraction of the spoke length. So if you want to, the, the radial distance 
uh, from you know, this point to its corresponding point, corresponding to radial distance a half, is simply the point halfway along that spoke from the skeleton out to the boundary. Okay, so radial distance is just fraction of, of spoke length, and spoke length is, varies as you move along the. But when you do that, you can talk about the onion skin <coughs> for any out for any fraction. So in this example is about half. It's halfway, and so this is the onion skin corresponding to halfway. And you get a, an onion skin for any any fraction for a quarter for 0.95 for. for you know, any fraction you want. And for every, once you have the onion skins, you can talk about their geometry, their normals, their tangents, <coughs> and so on. And the, that ends up yielding correspondences in directions for any point in the interior. <coughs> Right, so if I have a point in the interior that I want to talk about here, and it corresponds to this point here, I don't just have a mapping from the point to the point, I also have a map from the directional information at that point to the, to the directional information in the target place. And that turns out to be pretty powerful. <coughs> okay, so what I've tried to explain to you is that if you have a, be a, a better way of doing mapping than just pointwise boundary places onto each other, you can use it to generate a diffeomorphism for the, for, for the object. And it's, it's not just skeletal models, that's the one I think is particularly effective. But the point is there exist other skeletal mo uh, other models that can do it. But basically, if the idea is you want to do a mapping of the interior of, the, of an object, then skeletal is designed to do that for you. Okay? Question. Okay, so we've been talking about generating correspondences, and if we want to start from a PDM, then we need a way to generate skeletons from PDMs, and we'll be talking about that. All right. But now I'm done with this section on PDMs. We've covered I mean, we had a beginning part of the course where we did some overview and then some math, right? And now math about shape of shape of boundaries. And now we've talked about PDMs and, and how to talk about distances between PDMs and get correspondences. And now we're going to move to a whole new section of the course where basically take the position that PDMs are a, not a, a particularly strong representation and we can do a lot better than PDMs, okay? And so we're going to be talking about non-PDM representations of objects. So here's a new slide set that we're going to be working from for quite a while. And that's not what I wanted to do. Okay, so in particular, we're going to be first talking about Srivastava's important idea that, wait a second, this correspondence stuff gets in our way. <coughs> 
and we'd like to have a shape representation that doesn't depend on correspondences, that can do a shape description where we need, needn't define exactly what's in correspondence with what. Uh, we're going to then spend a whole lot of time on the skeletal representation in three basic forms. <coughs> First of all, we're going to talk about the granddaddy of all skeletal representations, the so-called Blum skeletal representation, some, which is called, which, in which the name skeletal was re, was replaced by medial, or more precisely, the word medial from Blum got changed into a, a generalization that we call skeletal. And it's important for you to understand <coughs> what the mathematics is of the Blum representation and why ultimately it needed to be generalized into, some, into these, op, these various kinds of skeletal representations that are not directly medial. And we'll be talking about, about three uh, kinds of skeletons, namely the SREPs that we use here, which are <coughs> basically places that, that I showed you just now, where there's a sampled grid of places in the on, of the skeleton and spokes at, that, at those scant samples. We'll talk about a new, a new method, uh, still being invented actually, but well along, by Mosen and Tahiri, which involves swept planar cross sections of the object. So we have the object and we have cross sections uh, that don't, don't intersect within the object. And we'll be talking about Paul Yushkovich's um, CM reps, which um, he himself will be lecturing on. Okay. And these S reps have their own, well, these skeletal representations in general, but the S reps in particular have their own mathematics that we have to have to spend some time on. And then we have this idea that I talked about last time that we're trying to find diffeomorphisms from the ellipsoid, which is the simplest object whose skeleton, skeletal description we know. In fact, it's Blum, the Blum description is just what we want, it, want for that. And how to map them onto target objects and get fitted frames. <laughs> uh, and then the, the, we have to face the question of well, yeah, that's fine, but no one gives us SREPs. <coughs> People give us boundary meshes, typically, as our input. And so then we have to have a means of <coughs> deriving the SREPs from the, from the boundary meshes. And when we have all that, then we have the idea that we have a set of boundary meshes as our data, and for each one of them, we want to derive this SREP. And then we want to do statistics on the SREPs, because now you get features that are useful, such as these ones I talked about here of width and <coughs> interior curvature, including these fitted frames that I talked about and the, the way they spring. And when we finish that, we will have an example of something that lives on a curved space, okay? <coughs> Typically, a Cartesian of product of a large number of spheres. <coughs> And we'll want to be able to do statistics on those, those things, those shape spaces, 
are Riemannian manifolds, and I've defined that term. And then the question is, how do you do statistics on what do you mean by the mean or the covariance or what have you uh, <clears throat> in the case of entities that each entity, this, each whole SREP lives on a high dimensional Riemannian man manifold shape space. So that's where we're going, and we're going to start with the Srivastava boundary geometry modulo correspondence, meaning you've, you've found a way to ignore correspondence. <coughs> so, we have two objects, you know, a hand and another hand. Clementine and another Clementine. Okay, and we have this, some, this general notion that this Clementine has a special place here where the stem was and another place here where it was indented but wait a second, this one may be like that, and the next one may be like that, and the next one may be like that, and there may be a bigger, a bigger clementine and a smaller clementine, and while I may be able to establish correspondence here, I don't know how to establish correspondence in terms of this rotation, right, because of the symmetry. And so the idea is that let's first, let's first of all understand our object as a mapping from a sphere. We've talked about that already, right? And, and the sphere has this base parameterization that is theta phi, right? Latitude and longitude. So for any given point, you know where it is on a unit sphere if you, if you know its latitude and longitude. Right? Uh, in 2D, we're talking about mapping from a circle to the object, and you, you parameterize by the angle theta from the equator of the circle, if you will. And you map, say, for each point on theta, it maps onto some particular point x of theta. And so in 2D, I have an xy for the point it maps onto. In 3D, I have an xyz. OK, so I have an xyz and, uh, of theta and phi. Got it? OK. And so that mapping if you have geometry, I'm sorry, if you have a particular param so-called parameterization, you are mapping <coughs> the place u underline theta phi onto <coughs> some reparameterization of that. So now I take my sphere and I can reparameterize it by saying, no, 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 here's the base, here's the base theta, and this guy is got a very different position, right? It's now almost 2 pi. This dash place is almost 2 pi from that one, whereas it was only I don't know what 40 pi over 4 from the first basis. Okay, so far so good. I can, I can re-parameterize what, what I mean by the thetas. And that the gamma on u maps the thetas that I had with this base position onto the thetas that I had with this. Here's where theta equals 0 is. Okay, so the gamma re-parameterizes. But it's not just that you may re-parameterize in a 
in a rigid way, if I have my uh, if I have my boundary here of this object, I may want to stretch my parameters in one part and make it not, to, not stretched on the other. That is to say, if I want to go from here to here, I want to go from this place to this place on my sphere, in one parameterization, this might go from here to here. But in another parameterization, it may go from here to here. I, the speed at which I uh, move along my circle vary, can vary. So the point is the parameterization involves this gamma function that has a speed function on going around the circle, or in the case of going around the, around the sphere. And so some places would speed up, and other places may slow down, and so, you, you know, you, anyway, the basic notion is, you know, sort of the fruit stays the same, but I can take my skin and sort of rotate it around and stretch out certain parts and and still the shape stays the same. The ultimate shape stays the same, it's just the parameterization varies. Okay? Another example is my hand. If I push my skin around, right, I'm changing the parameterization. But I, if I have done this in a clever way. The shape hasn't changed, it's just where's where. How we refer to where's where changes. And so Srivastava's book, which he, uh, which focuses, <coughs> initial, this book focuses on curves uh, and not surfaces, is very well laid out in this book by him and Klassen called fun Functional and Shape Data Analysis, and you can find that online. And those of you who are taking the course for credit would do well to read the, the, plain, the plain curves ch chapter. They, they also can talk about curves in three space that aren't in a plane, and also curves that are uh, uh, functions, if you will, uh, they're in they're in the plane, but the axes are not equivalent. One of them is the, the, the say the time axis, and the other one is the value of whatever happens at that time axis. <coughs> um, okay, so what we're trying to do here, or what they have tried to do, is to try to mod out boundary parameterization. And, the, and they want to also mod out alignment. So they want to have the, the, the representation not only mod out the way the skin has, but also whether the, uh, the object is rotated or, or scaled or translated. Okay? So they want to mod out both alignment of the object and parameterization. And the idea they have is that over all possible alignments, all possible similarity transforms, rotation, translation, and uniform scaling, and over all possible parameterizations of the sphere, or in this their case of the circle, because we're talking about curves, um, you want to talk about all of those being in the same equivalence class. So, you know, so this guy and this guy and one that has a bigger Clementine but the same shape other than that and, and ones that 
that parameterize along so that this and this and this and this are all the same. But anyway, so that the skin changes in its parameterization. All those are going to be in a single class. Okay? And they're going so they're going to be talking about uh, a curve Q that is parameterized by gamma, and they're going to be interested in the equivalence class of Q gamma over all all similarity transforms and all parameterization. All smooth parameterization. Okay? And once they do that, they can talk about the distance between the equivalence class of Q2, <coughs> the equivalence class of Q1s, and the equivalence class of two Q2s where this describes one curve and that describes one, another curve, or when, they, when it's applied to surfaces, this equivalence class of surfaces and that equivalence class of surfaces. And then they can talk, they want an appropriate measure of the distance between two such equivalence classes. So the equivalence class idea is the modding out of, the modding out of correspondence and similarity transforms. And they show <coughs> that what you want is something that says that the representation of a curve should be gam gamma applied with a parameterization should be the gamma applied to Q, the gamma applied to the curve, divided by the rate of change of gamma. <coughs> In other words, as you move around the curve, how fast, how fast you're moving around the circle. <coughs> That's the dot, the time, time variable where you have this, where you have this parameterization. And the question is, how, how fast does this velocity is this velocity as you move around the move around the curve? <clears throat> this is somewhat hairy stuff, and you ought to be asking questions because I imagine it's not completely clear. Okay, so there is this page, so a section of a page from, <coughs> from uh, the book, the plain curves book, that says basically if you have a curve param parameterized by gamma and you have that same curve parameterized, I'll call this by gamma 1, and the same curve parameterized by gamma 2 that we're going to call a new version of the object, Q2. <coughs> if they are simply parameterized versions of each other, they ought to have the same equivalence classes. Okay, that is to say the distance between this guy's equivalence class and this guy's equivalence class ought to be the same equivalence class. The distance should be zero between these, those two equivalence classes. And they go on to show that if you want that property to hold, then you want this... Uh, this uh, square root of gamma dot involved. Okay? And this is the proof of that. And I'm not going to go through it, but you should 
be able to see that essentially there's this beta 1 and the beta 2 <laughs> which are related to each other by being in essentially in one of one of a variant I, one is the sim involves simply another gamma and they do the calculations and show that if you use this representation then you get this nice property that the distance between the equivalents the difference between the representations is zero okay so fine <coughs> So <coughs> now they go and define the distance between two equivalence classes. So this equation here, the double bar is the, is the distance function that I was talking about here. <coughs> so distance between the equivalence class on Q1 so I'm talking about brackets, <coughs> and Q2. And so now I have two curves. They can be closed curves or not. <coughs> but one is going to have its equivalence class. <coughs> and this guy is going to have its equivalence class. <coughs> and we're going to define a distance function between this equivalence class and that equivalence class as the distance between these two objects. Right. And once we do that, once we have distances, we can do statistics. Right? In fact, Anuj Srivastava is a statistics professor. Uh, and uh, he's at Florida State. Uh, interesting story in the sense I was in the sense that uh, there was a very important contributor to shape matters named uh, Michael Miller, uh, who uh, together with, why am I blocking on his name, a Brown professor, uh, Ulf Grenander, together with Ulf Grenander, well Ulf Grenander came up with an idea and Mike Miller essentially did a sabbatical with Ulf and they worked together. And they came up with what ended up being the LGDMM idea. But Mike had, Mike was a professor at Washington University for many years since he's been a professor in ECE, in electrical and computer engineering at Johns Hopkins. Uh, he, but while he was at Washington University, he had had the sabbatical with Fernander, and he and, and Mike had three very important students, doctoral students. And one of them was Sarang Joshi, and I've just mentioned him. And he's a professor of biomedical engineering at the moment in Utah. Another one is <coughs> uh, a Anuj Srivastava, who became a professor of statistics, despite the fact that he started off in sort of the same related area. Right? And the other one is Gary Christensen, and Gary uh, is in a department uh, within the engineering school, not biomedical engineering, at University of Iowa. The point is that these guys, these guys have gone their separate ways and they still have a relationship to each other, but they're in very different departments of, of their universities. Um, anyway, fine. So, Srivastava took this position and, and here's what, we're, what he's saying. The distance between them should be the minimum over all possible Rotations. Okay, so the first thing he does is <coughs> mod out translation and probably uniform scaling. In other words, he does alignment that doesn't include rotations, but alignment and position and size. 
And then what's left for the similarity transform is SON, where N is the dimension of the space. This is the rotation, the, the space of all rotations. So SO2 is the spa space of rotations in one dimension, in two dimensions. Uh, SO3 is the, is the space of rotations in three dimensions, and so on, right? And so for an n-dimensional n objects, and I, we're mostly concerned with n equals three here. You want to mod, mod out all rotations, and you want to mod out all gammas all reparameterizations, okay? And then you want the distance. Now, in terms of L2 norm, between the Q1 itself, okay, so, okay, so here's Q1. And all possible rotations and reparameterizations of Q2. So we have an example here, but this guy rotated is also in the same class. And this guy uh, with the speed changing as you go around here, that maybe not no longer arc length speed, but some other parameterization is all in the same class. And basically what they say is, if you take this guy and you take all possible rotations and all possible reparameterizations, there's one of them that is closest in L2 distance between this guy and the, the appropriately rotated version, rotated and reparameterized version of this guy, all right? But that, that L2 distance has to be modulated by this representation of distance that we talked about that has the square root of gamma dot in it. I have a question. So, uh, I guess for me, it doesn't seem, the whole alignment thing doesn't seem very obvious. In particular, like scaling can dramatically change the, ge change the geometry. For instance, take a sphere, the, cur uh, the curvature being 1 over r, where is the radius? Since uh, it seems like for me, good. It's intuitively that alignment should be in somewhere in this optimization problem. I don't trust that you could do it separately. Well, okay, so this gets, I mean, good, very good questions, uh, first of all. The first part of it is traditionally people have called the word shape as properties modulo the similarity transforms. And that includes that one sphere and, and a bigger sphere have the same shape, okay? <clears throat> but that's unnecessary. The space of all similarity transforms, that is of all rotations, translations, and scales, is a perfectly good group in the mathematical sense of group, right? But so, it, so is the what the, the set of all translations and rotations without scale. That's another group, and it's a perfectly valid, valid group also. And there are a zillion other p possible groups that you might choose. And so now when you talk about shape, you really have to say shape with respect to a particular group of transformation, an alignment sort of transformations. And so what you're suggesting is, well, yeah, I would like a big Clementine and a little Clementine to have different shape, right? And that's perfectly fine. All you're saying is your group of, of transformations, alignment transformations, don't include scaling, okay? In Srivastava's case, he, he has assumed modding out that group already. That is to say, doing an alignment, if an alignment transformation and a scale transformation. Or if you don't want to mod out the scale transformation, you don't have to. But he's assuming that you have when he makes this definition. I couldn't agree with you more, Michael. As far as I'm concerned, size is a very important 
parameter that you want to do statistics on, right? And, you know, people in medical field that have a swollen something or another, some object, that's important, important uh, difference, important featural difference, at least if it's normalized with, you know, if you have some brain structure and it's normalized relative to the, the size of the whole head or something like that. So yes, that is not something that we're assuming in, the, in Anuja's point of view. He's assuming that scaling is modded out. Okay, so, and big O s simply says this, the set of all, this the so-called orbit of, gives you all the, all possible reparameterizations and, and rotations. Okay, so this is the definition that is the important basis for Anuja's work. And wait a second, we've been saying that shape is about geometry and how is geometry involved, right? And so, if you have arc length parameterization, right, so you're talking about the relationship between the circle and one of these guys, and arc length is basically angle along a unit circle. And here you're mapping, you're ma mapping delta theta onto delta distances along here as proportions to their uh, proportions to of that total length. Okay, so if you're going if pi over 4 is 1 eighth of 2 pi, then I'm talking about a distance here that's 1 eighth of the total arc length of this object, so-called arc length parameterization S, then it turns out that gamma dot turns out to be simply the curvature of the object, kappa. <coughs> the ordinary curve curvature for a planar curve, the rate of change on the swing of its normal per unit distance. <coughs> so rewriting the gamma dot as square root of kappa, let us now assuming arc length parameterization, although not necessarily a, not a, still a starting theta zero, no, square theta equals zero specification, you find that the same formula that I wrote on the previous screen involves <coughs> square root of kappa as the part of the representation. So hiding in there is information about the curvature of the curve. Notice that kappa, I mean that, sorry, that the normal on the curve is orthogonal to the tangent of the curve. And so you have this positional function x as a function of position along the, uh, around the object. And x prime of s dx by ds dy and, and the corresponding position dx by ds and dy by ds, that pair is x of s is little x of s y of s. And so the First derivative is x prime y prime, and x prime y prime uh, turns out to be in the normal direction. <coughs> and if it's parameterized, this normal vector as unit 
size. That is to say, this squared plus that squared equals 1. Okay? So now we have the normal and curvature is in, comes from d of the normal with respect to s. How fast the normal swings per unit distance, s. Uh, and we talked about that being ca uh, kappa m, I guess. And the kappa turns out comes in, comes out of the second derivative. It's the magnitude of dn by ds, except for its sign. Well, so kappa is defined as positive sign. So the upshot is that we're talking about second derivatives being involved when you when you want to do appropriate uh, reparameterization to deal with reparameterization. So hidden in there is curvature. And then they go and point out that curvature is a bit of a problem because, <coughs> uh, because it's a second derivative and when you have bumps on your uh, measurement errors on your boundary, the curvature gets to be hard to calculate. And Kungerink says, yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't, the way you do that is you take you understand that there's an aperture when you compute your, your derivatives. So if you have a boundary that's like that, but you use an aperture with a sort of a Gaussian weighting that computes the, the, the derivatives at a place like here, with this aperture, you essentially get away from the, the uh, effect of this measurement noise. Okay, so upshot is curvature measured with an appropriate measurement scale, aperture, is what's being used to associate one object with another. Here, but ultimately saying that this is a high curvature place and it's better if it's, if it's associated with this high curvature place and this uh, indentation, so to space, which has, it should have, um, I, I've got to be careful here because it, what I said here was about 2D curvatures and, and curvatures on surfaces and what I should have said is this, it, this is, the kappa can be signed in 2D it's uns unsigned in but 2D surfaces in 3D. But in any case, the point is that you have an indentation here and you have an indentation here. And so you have some, and, and so this is, ends up saying that you want the curvature information to be involved in associating one object with the other. So ultimately, it is implying a particular correspondence. It's just hiding it in this math of equivalence classes. Okay, so here, once you have distance, then you can talk about geodesics. And so if you have this object on the left here and this object on the right here, you can talk about the shortest distance path between this guy and this guy. The same with each of these examples. Okay, and so you end up with, once you have distance, you can do statistics. Once you have distance, you can do geodesics. All sorts of good stuff. Okay, so we're running out of time for today. Um, what we're gonna do next time is go to uh, Anuja student Gert, uh, Sebastian Kurtek's work, where now instead of curves we have surfaces, and you'll see a similar sort of thing happening there as happened for curves in planar curves. Okay?
Questions before we start? Yeah, question. Uh, is, is there a reason why there's two brackets around? Is what? It's a typo. Okay. Where? Just for the Q1, Q2, there's, there's one bracket around one, two brackets around the second. It should be one for both, it's just a typo. Yeah, sorry, thank you. That. Yep. Um, also, this, uh, this second bracket is wrong. Also, um, I might not be understanding this correctly, but doesn't the re-parametrization mean that, like, the, the clementine he has is this equivalent, like, cucumber? Yeah. What do you want to know about the cucumber? Uh, it, just, it just seems like from, it doesn't make it very useful because like, well, the clementine and the cucumber have different equivalence classes, right? Right. right. Yeah. But the equivalent class of cucumbers allows you to sort of shift the skin of the cucumber around it any way you want, stretch it in some places, not another, but keep the shape of the cucumber. Yeah, but moreover, even in two spherical coordinates, if you take the different rate around the sphere, the sphere you still get the same shape. <laughs> so the spherical coordinates assumes unit distances along the sphere, and the, the equivalence class includes the possibility that some part of the sphere takes a, takes a lot of area if you will, and the rest of it, n normally you would think that has larger area now corresponds to smaller area because you sort of stretched your parameterization of one and pressed it in the other. I always like the example of moving the skin around on your hand, like stretching and compressing it, because it doesn't change the shape of the hand, but it changes, like, if you consider your skin to be the parameterization of that shape. Right. So if I stretch this here, I still have the same hand. And now you can talk about the difference between a cucumber and a, gem and a clementine. Because you have a set, set of all parameterizations of that cucumber and all parameterizations of that clementine. And you're talking about essentially the distance of one to the closest parameterization of the other. <coughs> Okay, thank you, see you uh, on Tuesday.